Hello OGT friends from around the world and welcome to a new lesson with me, Stefan Erler, the founder of the T-Masters blog and the T-Masters.com T-Boutique. Uh, today we have again a wonderful um, program for this class. We are doing the second uh, class uh, on um, the second part on The White Road, Journey into an Obsession by Edmund Deval. And today we are going to focus on uh, porcelain from Meissen and how porcelain got invented in Europe. I see some uh, people connecting. Hello, Gregory, and uh, hello, Elizabeth. Uh, glad that you can join. So, and um, because we are going to talk about Meissen, as you can see here already, I have my two Meissen cups. Haha! -ha. Uh, I'll explain a little bit more about these, and you can see they are a bit similar to the flower cups in, in shape and almost in size and maybe actually also uh, uh, similar to this um, De Roi cup but uh, the De Roi cup is a little bit smaller this uh, blanc de chine okay I don't have uh, much more mycin here uh, my parents have a lot of uh, mycin uh, but I do have um, one plate, uh, but this one is not from Meissen, it's from Fürstenberg. Fürstenberg is the second uh, porcelain um, uh, manufacturer in, uh, in Germany that was established, I think, in Bavaria. And they also do a nice um, blue and white. And uh, this teapot is from Sanchia, so we are going to, uh, to uh, mix some uh, Taiwanese and some German and some Chinese porcelain today. Okay, so uh, let's go back to our book and start with um, uh, uh, with Meissen. I'll, I'll start a little bit later on to, to brew my um, uh, Baojong. This week's uh, Baojong, uh, uh, this week I, I selected the Baojongs for this spring and they are going to be added to my selection uh, shortly. The, the first one already uh, is released and uh, I will release the other. This is uh, the last one that will be least released. It's uh, uh, Jin Guanin, a new cultivar of uh, Baojong uh, and therefore also a new plantation. I'm pretty excited about this one and, uh, to, and I will brew it uh, during this class a bit, uh, later on once I start to, to feel thirsty. Okay, um, if you did not watch um, last week's um, uh, lesson and uh, if you just stumble on me uh, by chance I recommend that you start with the lesson one on um, porcelain from uh, Jindelzen that we did last week uh, before you uh, you go to this uh, class because there is a link um, if you remember last week I was talking about um, this uh, wonderful uh, 284 steps high Pagoda made by um, Yongle Emperor in China and this uh, octagonal pagoda nine story high was really fascinating. It was uh, the, probably the highest building in its time in, in China and uh, it was made of porcelain. Maybe it was not the highest. Uh, I'm, not, I'm not sure about it, but it was really uh, a very high building in, uh, in that region, in that city. It was made with lots of uh, porcelain and uh, illuminated at night, it uh, really looked uh, fantastic. You could see it from uh, from miles around. And um, visitors from uh, the, uh, from uh, Europe who saw it were really fascinated by by this pagoda, something made of porcelain. So porcelain is uh, at that time uh, was very very expensive in 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 Europe. It was called considered white gold, and that you would use white gold to make a whole pagoda. Uh, at least on the um, to uh, to decorate it uh, seems like a, a crazy idea. It's like a, you you would paint uh, your your building with gold, and uh, it's the biggest big building in the town, and it's f and the outside is uh, decorated with gold. That's uh, really uh, it blew the mind of uh, of visitors, and um, therefore the fame of this pagoda traveled all to the courts of Europe, and uh, in the courts of Europe the what uh, we, before we go to, to to Germany? Actually, we have to go to the most powerful court in Europe at that time. In Europe, what was it? It was, of course, 
la France, France, hein? and uh, Louis XIV, the king's son, actually, probably he did not feel so happy to hear about uh, this um, wonderful uh, pagoda in, uh, in China, because, uh, what, the Chinese have something that I don't have, this was uh, something very difficult uh, that no, no ruler can accept. And um, at that time, he had a, a mistress, uh, Madame de Montespan, and uh, she heard about this uh, story of this pagoda, and she said, ah, she, uh, she must have whispered to the king, I also want a pagoda, I also want a porcelain building, please, please, I want my porcelain building. And uh, so Louis XIV, after having built Versailles, he thought, okay, for my mistress, I can do anything, I'm the king, uh, the roi soleil, the king, the sun king. Let's do also um, a building of, of porcelain and uh, we'll call it the Trianon de Porcelain. Sounds much more French. Uh, and um, he, of course, then asked uh, his uh, most loyal servant, uh, Colbert, to arrange for the building of um, this Trianon de Porcelain. Now, Colbert uh, is uh, the French. Uh, financier, uh, the, the guy who really uh, looks after the, the finances of, of the king. And uh, he probably did not have a calculator, but uh, he was good at calculations. And uh, he probably quickly uh, found out, wow, if I'm going to build a, a building of uh, imported porcelain, it's going to, to cost us uh, too much money. Uh, then the uh, king won't have any more money to, um, to go to war or to buy Alsace from, from the Germans. Uh, uh, and um, therefore, he decided, okay, let's try to do this uh, uh, Trianon de Porcelain, not with uh, imported uh, porcelain from China, too expensive. Let's be more nationalistic, protectionist. That was always uh, his, uh, his thinking. Let's do it with French porcelain. Now, he turned to um, Rouen and saint Cloud, which had some uh, manufacturers, and they were trying to, do, to imitate uh, porcelain from China, but it was only soft paste uh, porcelain. Uh, he also maybe bought some uh, from, from Delft. Uh, of course, there were some uh, real vases from, uh, from China, but more for the inside decoration. Uh, but the, the tiles, they were made of uh, European uh, porcelain, uh, soft, pa soft paste porcelain, uh, and uh, this, the quality of this porcelain actually was not enough, not good enough, and uh, after a few years, I'm pretty quickly, the quality of these tiles deteriorated, and uh, it began um, almost like a, uh, raining in the Trianon of porcelain. The, there were a lot of water damage because this European uh, so-called porcelain was not uh, uh, resistant enough to, to rain. And, um, and so actually it was uh, not really a, a big success. It impressed uh, probably Madame de Montespan for, for a while when it was brand new. Uh, but anyway, he, uh, Louis XIV probably changed uh, uh, his mistress's uh, even faster than he changed the building. So uh, let's call it a half success. However, uh, in the meantime, uh, while when it was built and uh, uh, when it was still uh, okay, this, this Trianon de Porcelain, we have uh, an, a young prince from Saxony called um, Prince Augustus of Saxony who visited um, Versailles and Le Trianon de Porcelain in 1687. And uh, he thought, oh, that's uh, pretty beautiful. That's uh, uh, really very, a very nice place. And um, uh, let's, let's just uh, remember that um, this young German prince uh, saw this uh, Trianon de Porcelain when he was young. Then we have another uh, person coming into our, our story. Huh? I told you about Colbert, the, the guy who, who calculated that it was too expensive to make it all of with the Chinese porcelain. And um, he was looking for a tutor for his son. And uh, so uh, at that time, you did not put your kids to, uh, to the best uh, private school. Actually, you let the private school come to you. You would hire a, a private tutor. 
and uh, he had a letter of recommendation from uh, Spinoza telling him, oh, we have this uh, German guy called uh, Ehrenfried Walter von Schirnhaus. Uh, please, uh, he's a really brilliant mathematician and scientist. I think he, he would be a good tutor for, for your uh, children. And Colbert hired this um, uh, Ehrenfried von Schirnhaus, uh, this German, to be his um, uh, uh, son's tutor for, for a while. Now, uh, this um, uh, Jan Chienhaus, uh, after, being, after doing some tutoring, he would also, like a Spinoza, make lenses. And uh, with lenses, when you can focus the, the light, the ray of light, you can also create more intense heat. And uh, he was uh, doing some experiments with his lenses, with heat, melting things and uh, yeah, he was uh, quite brilliant and so brilliant that um, he was uh, uh, the first German to be uh, not had nominated at the um, uh, French Royal Academy of Science. So really a, a brilliant mind uh, doing lots of uh, uh, experimenting like uh, scientists do it and this was a time with also, I think he went to see Newton, uh, he uh, lots of connections, Leibniz, also this math mathematician. Uh, this, uh, this was uh, the people that uh, he would meet and um, that, he would, uh, that he would know. Um, well, what happens um, next is in uh, 1694, uh, the brother of Augustus of Saxony dies and Augustus now becomes uh, Willy is uh, the prince king of uh, Saxony and uh, he also manages later on to become king of uh, Poland. Uh, and um, at that time, when he goes to the throne, uh, he, he only owns 16 pieces, or the, the, the court only owns 16 pieces of uh, Chinese porcelain. Uh, they were a gift a long time ago from, um, I think, Kangxi. And um, by, the, uh, by the time he died, uh, they do an inventory in Germany, as they are always very so with inventories. And um, the inventory states that there were 35,798 pieces of porcelain. Wow. So, wow, he had uh, really purchased uh, 35,782 pieces during his, uh, his reign. So he must have um, been buying uh, like uh, 10, uh, 10 pieces every day of, uh, of his reign. Really something uh, quite amazing. So he was actually suffering from um, Porzellan Krankheit. Porzellan Krankheit, this long German uh, name means the illness of porcelain. The illness of porcelain is when you are so fascinated, so much in love with porcelain that you cannot not buy it, and that you have to own it, that you have to uh, collect as much porcelain as you can. And so this was really the, the illness of um, Augustus of Saxony. Uh, he was uh, uh, collecting lots of um, uh, porcelain from China, but not even just China, also from uh, Japan, uh, mm -hmm. the Kakiemon porcelain. Um, for him, really, this was white gold, and um, uh, this guy really is, uh, uh, at that time, uh, so the top spender on porcelain in Europe. Uh, he's uh, really a bit like, a, like the Playboy. Huh? You, at that time, you did not have um, Porsche, Ferraris. Uh, that you would that you could collect, uh, whereas you would buy horses, but uh, it's you cannot bring your, your horse in your um, in your castle. Uh, so what you would collect really is porcelain to impress your your guests and also to feel good about yourself. Porcelain was really called white gold in uh, in Europe and uh, and for a good reason. Okay, now I start to be a bit uh, thirsty. Let's preheat my porcelain teapot and make some tea. And when he visited um, 
Louis XIV's court when he was 19. The Edmund de Val, uh, in his book, he tells us, oh, he must have spent uh, uh, one fifth of his um, money on uh, uh, his appearance, on his clothes, uh, two fifths maybe on uh, drinks and uh, uh, and food, entertainment, and uh, and the rest on women. And that's uh, really the kind of guy uh, that uh, that you have with this um, uh, August, Augustus of uh, Saxony. So really a big lover of uh, porcelain and now he he has a chance that he became ruler of uh, Saxony and of um, uh, Poland but still even when you are king there are always limits on your finances and uh, especially with this kind of guy who uh, likes to ha entertain to uh, have lots of mistresses also don't forget uh, these times were not so peaceful so you also needed to uh, have your army to protect your uh, your territory so he the money was always a, a problem so uh, one thing that um, a lot of uh, scientists were doing at that time uh, they were doing alchemy and in uh, Dresden uh, where he, uh, the center of his rule he had a, a, gold, a gold house so a place where they would try to make gold with lead and uh, oh it's not so easy A very nice, very typical um, uh, Baojong, even though it's a, a different cultivar. The um, cultivar is uh, Huang Guanin, uh, Jin Guanin. Okay, so it's a, a really new cultivar, this um, Jin Guanin closed uh, a cultivar also that uses um, Chi Guanin as a parent. So it's also a new plantation in um, Wenshan. Therefore, the leaves are very big with um, with stems uh, because of the first um, harvests of uh, this kind of um, new plantation is uh, uh, you always get a bit all kinds of leaves. The trees are not uh, fully grown, so they are not um, producing very um, even uh, sizes of uh, of leaves. The color is light green yellow. So a Taiwanese teapot on a Furstenberger plate and in now two Meissen cups. But we have not come yet to uh, to the beginning. Hmm. And what we have now is 
Augustus of Saxony, uh, spending lots of money, looking for new ways of um, financing his uh, excesses, and uh, scientists trying to make gold out of lead uh, in uh, an, a gold house in, uh, in Dresden, uh, where there are uh, lots of different people who try to, to, to make uh, gold. And of course, um, uh, sometimes uh, Augustus, he believes that uh, they are going to, uh, to succeed. Uh, it's uh, uh, at the court and you have to, to be a, a, good to, uh, a good talker and to try to impress him. And, um, uh, he, and then maybe he will uh, give you some, uh, some money, like uh, nowadays people uh, buy a lottery ticket, hoping to, to, uh, to strike on gold. Now, the um, alchemists in Saxony had uh, uh, also a, a good um, background because uh, in uh, the south of Saxony, just um, at the uh, frontier, at the border with the current uh, Czech Republic, we have um, mountains called Erzgebirge. And Erzgebirge uh, means um, mountains. And Erz actually means ore, O-R-E. Uh, and this ore means a lot of minerals, lots of different minerals in these mountains uh, that can be mined and then that can be transformed. And uh, these scientists, uh, they, they are wondering, uh, may, may, can I use this, uh, uh, this ore from these uh, mountains and maybe one of them can be turned into gold? And, uh, or, uh, or in maybe it can be turned into something else. Now, uh, Chien House, uh, having spent time in, uh, in France, and uh, now, but since he's Germany, he's now uh, back in, uh, in Germany. His uh, wife is uh, from Saxony, and uh, he's, um, he has a new interest, he has a, a new passion. He's thinking maybe he can make porcelain, and uh, with his lenses, He's trying to um, melt different ores uh, and to see uh, if he can turn it into porcelain. And he's also um, doing uh, reverse engineering. He's melting uh, Chinese porcelain to find out what does Chinese porcelain contain. Like this, he finds out that it contains alumina, silica, and calcium. And so Chien House, being a respected scientist, uh, with lots of letters of recommendation, as I mentioned before, uh, he goes to Augustus of Saxony, and uh, because he hears also, he know, everybody knows that Augustus is fascinated with porcelain. So instead of pitching him turning uh, lead into gold, he tell, tells him, maybe I can turn uh, some of the ore in your uh, in the mines in the Erzgebirge into porcelain, and uh, well. This uh, idea uh, quite pleases um, Augustus of Saxony, and uh, he okays uh, the, the tests. He gives uh, some funds to uh, Chien House and let him work in this gold house uh, with other alchemists who were looking for gold. But Chien House, he would be looking for porcelain. And uh, the great thing with uh, this uh, gold house. Uh, being in Saxony, being in, in Germany, is that the Germans, they are very thorough. Uh, I know I'm half German, and uh, we like to keep lists, inventories, and every experiment is recorded so that uh, they can learn from it and that they don't repeat uh, twice the same mistakes. Uh, and there's um, also lots of um, uh, inventories of the equipment that were used. So Edmund de Waal, uh, what is really nice in, in his book is that he went to all these places. He went to Versailles. He went now to, uh, to he's now in Dresden, looking at the archives and reading in uh, and this list, going through these lists of um, uh, inventories and uh, experiments. And uh, well, to say the truth, so far these, all these experiences are failures. Uh, in uh, you know, so we are. Uh, roughly between uh, 1694, uh, when Augustus goes to the throne, until 1701, failure, 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 failure. However, 
On October 1st, 1701, something would change uh, the, the course of uh, events. There is a rumor that a boy who is working for um, a pharmacist, that this young boy, 19 year old only, has been able to uh, turn uh, metal into gold in front of credible witnesses. Uh, how, how is it possible? So this boy is called Butker. Uh, but Butcher, uh, actually is the, the, the right um, pronunciation. Uh, B O double uh, point on top T T G E R. Mm -hmm. So Butcher, uh, after making this trick, he vanishes. And uh, when uh, Augustus of Saxony hears about it, so he's uh, really very interested. Wow, somebody really is making gold. Uh, it's not. Um, uh, it's not just a story. It's a reality that it's possible to make gold. So let's find him. Let's find him. And uh, so this is also uh, very maybe. Um, usually, when somebody says, "Oh, I can make gold," they go to to the ruler and to ask for more funds. But what is really uh, unusual is that uh, instead of um, coming forward, this boy is uh, dis has disappeared. So he creates a desire for him, and everybody is looking for him. So he appears much less uh, a liar because he does not seem to be so active to try to uh, to sell his knowledge or uh, to pitch his uh, ideas. So after a while, they they find him. Uh, I think it was in Berlin, and then they get him back to Saxony. Mm. And now let's compare it with um, Meissen. Mm. Yeah, very nice. <laughs> okay, so he he disappears, and um, they, he's bring he's brought back to to Dresden, and there. Unlucky him, eh? it was, these are not um, human rights yet. So he becomes a prisoner of Augustus of Saxony. He does not want to uh, let go of uh, this uh, young guy who can turn um, metal into gold. Uh, in that experiment, actually, it was silver that he turned uh, apparently into, into gold, uh, according to the witnesses. So now he's a um, uh, um, prisoner and uh, he has to work in the gold house. And uh, next to him is a chin house who uh, looks at this young boy and uh, sees a lot of potential. And, oh, this, uh, uh, but uh, even though he's not able to, um, of course, to make uh, gold again, uh, but he sees that uh, he's quite familiar with um, grinding stones uh, and uh, working in because also he learned as a pharmacist so he's uh, quite good at making these experiments and uh, he has some intuitions and uh, they try to to come up to uh, and cooperate um, uh, kind of to, on these experiments now not to make uh, gold anymore but to make porcelain which seems a bit more an attainable uh, goal however uh, still lots of failures for five years, they don't come up with uh, with much. Sometimes Augustus is uh, disappointed and uh, cuts some funding. Sometimes he believes in it again and um, puts some fundings again. But finally, on um, May 29, 1706, they open the kiln and what they see, whoa, wow, that's uh, pretty amazing. Well, what did they see? No. Let's see. They saw something like this, red clay, similar to, actually similar to Ishing clay. And uh, this clay, uh, also similar to terracotta, but much stronger, much harder than any red clay that um, was produced in uh, Europe at that time, and much more similar to um, Ishing clay. So, um, Ishing clay was already uh, famous uh, also in, uh, in Europe. It was, a, it was already a thing. It was not as much uh, popular as, um, as porcelain, but um, they, they recognized the, that uh, what they obtained is, uh, is really pretty uh, close to, um, to Ishing. 
uh, red clay and that um, that it's very hard and uh, they come to and they and uh, Chenhaus and Butcher they go to um, Augustus of Saxony show him their red clay and it was uh, I think a, a vase huh? no. well uh, it was some, uh, something formed uh, of red and um, they uh, they call it uh, Jaspis porcelain uh, so red red porcelain and um, uh, Augustus actually is quite uh, quite happy with it huh? because he also knows of uh, about um, Ishing and uh, he okay is the start of production of lots of these uh, red clay uh, items and now none, and now he's happy he can uh, say oh I want a, a vase made uh, made like this uh, with uh, with this and these uh, uh, decorations and uh, now he can really much more monitor closely uh, what they make for him. But um, after uh, after a while, actually, uh, still they were not trying to make uh, red clay. They wanted to make uh, white porcelain. So he still pushes uh, Chen House and Butcher to make uh, porcelain, and they continue to. Um, uh, uh, again to uh, to work on uh, on porcelain and on January 15 1708 now two years later they do a first test which gives us gives them calc porcelain chalk uh, chalk porcelain so the very first test that succeeds with white porcelain um, and uh, of course Augustus is uh, thrilled very very happy that uh, the very first porcelain has been uh, made in um, in uh, in Europe. Uh, they were doing lots of different tests, mixing different um, uh, quantities, uh, uh, different ratios of um, of chalk um, and other materials. And now, January 15, 1708, first time it works. And uh, in April, right away. Uh, Augustus found, uh, founded the first uh, porcelain manufactory in um, uh, in Europe uh, and uh, in Germany. And uh, well, so that was in April 1708 that the first porcelain manufacturing was created. And in October, Chen House, who was uh, old already, uh, he dies. Uh, so he he got to see the results of uh, porcelain uh, but uh, did not live much uh, much longer and that's why uh, the discovery of porcelain in uh, Meissen in Germany is much more linked and given to Butcher uh, than to Chernhaus uh, because also uh, even though they cooperated but um, uh, most of the fame now goes to, to Butcher nowadays. Um, so uh, a few more um, uh, important dates on 1713, the very first uh, time that uh, uh, Dresden porcelain, Meisen porcelain is exhibited uh, at the Leipzig fair, uh, so five years later, the first fair, and uh, one year later, uh, 1714, Butcher is now free, uh, Augustus says, okay, my prisoner, now you have done your your job. You have uh, invented porcelain. We know the recipe, and uh, now you are you are free, uh, free to go. And um, five years later, actually, uh, he will also die uh, in 1719. And it's in um, 1720 that Meissen invents this logo of the two swords for as their trademark. So they will usually not put it uh, on uh, here. They will usually put it at the base of um, uh, of their cups or of uh, whatever items they, they are producing. So this is since 1720. And uh, if you want to date correctly in time uh, uh, a piece of uh, mycin, you have to look at uh, these two swords and uh, the way they were shaped is uh, different from uh, one period to another. Uh, now, uh, so 
uh, Meissen in Dresden uh, in Germany for Augustus as the very first uh, manufactory to be able to produce uh, porcelain. Augustus is of course uh, very happy now he can um, uh, he's uh, dreaming of even now selling his porcelain to the other courts of um, of Europe but of, uh, of course at that time now that uh, porcelain is made in, in Europe the other kings in Europe have uh, even better ideas to think oh why don't I make my own porcelain let's uh, and now that uh, they know that it's possible to make it in uh, Dresden, they send their spies, they try to hire workers from, um, uh, from Meissen to their own uh, uh, kingdom, so that uh, they can also get this uh, know-how and um, make their own porcelain, and that they don't have to rely on uh, Meissen porcelain like uh, they had to rely on uh, Chinese porcelain or Japanese porcelain in the past. So in this time in the 18th century, uh, the porcelain cabinet to have a room uh, with your collection of porcelain, that was really the ultimate thing to have. Uh, if you wanted to impress people, you would have your porcelain cabinet, like people now have um, a library, uh, a room with uh, the books, uh, where they, that they have read, uh, or they have uh, the garage with a beautiful car, uh, or they have the, the latest iPhone. Well, in the, in the 18th century, the thing to have was a porcelain cabinet where you could show off uh, the porcelain that you collected uh, with some porcelain from China, but now, lastly, and uh, finally, also porcelain from um, uh, uh, from Meissen or from uh, other places in Europe and uh, this is what we are going to um, to see also in the uh, next uh, in the next lesson maybe ne not next week maybe in the in two weeks uh, because next week is uh, will be a bit busy for new spring teas uh, but um, uh, so it's interesting to see that uh, porcelain really took off uh, thanks to uh, the uh, obsession of a uh, prince, uh, then king of Poland and uh, Saxony, who loved so much porcelain that he was spending so much money that actually had to make his own porcelain in order to, uh, uh, to finance his excess. Mm. And um, yeah, uh, it's a story with um, with spies, uh, with um, uh, uh, alchemy, uh, where you believe in turning uh, metals into gold, uh, and uh, therefore you also believe you can turn some uh, some minerals into white gold. But just you wonder, you don't know which uh, which minerals they are, and uh, thanks to the profusion of um, uh, different minerals in the Erzgebirge, this was really the, the best place to, um, to find uh, and to experiment with porcelain in Europe. And uh, also thanks to the sorrowfulness of uh, uh, the German scientists, a uh, mind that uh, they would really record all these different experiments they do, and uh, one day they, they just uh, struck gold, struck porcelain, and uh, they were able to find uh, by trial and error, trial and error, uh, the uh, correct ingredient to make um, to make porcelain, and this really changed then uh, porcelain making. It was much easier to make um, porcelain to your taste when the um, makers are just uh, sitting in the uh, in the next building. Uh, you are in the castle, of course. Uh, the the manufacturers were always very close to the castle, sometimes uh, in a different um, aisle of the of the castle, so they could uh, have the drawings much more similar to the to the taste of uh, the European um, uh, taste at the time. Uh, instead of having, um, well, actually, for for in the beginning, they would continue to imitate the um, same landscapes as the Chinese in order to say, oh, we can do things 
just like the, the Chinese, but after a while uh, they started to uh, put their own uh, style, their own creations in, uh, in the design of the porcelain. And what is interesting is um, at uh, around that time, uh, the, it was not just the West getting now finally the knowledge from, from China, but there was also some uh, back and forth transfer. Uh, let me say, uh, we have, uh, remember last week I was telling that the Jesuits, they were a bit uh, spying on uh, the Chinese and Père d'Entrecol, he wrote these two letters in 1712 and um, in uh, 1722 uh, from China. So actually, he, he was writing these letters about Jing De Zen porcelain making just at the time when Butcher was experimenting and when they finally uh, found um, how to make uh, porcelain. This would have saved them time if they had these uh, letters, just uh, it was a uh, 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 really at the same time, but also thanks to the Jesuits in uh, China, uh, there was also some technology and some know-how that was transferred from Europe to China. The Jesuits, they were uh, also tutoring the emperor of China, Kangxi. For instance, he loved to, um, uh, to learn about mathematics. He also loved um, uh, harpsichord, uh, playing uh, harpsichord music. That's why I put uh, this um, today this music of uh, harpsichord of, by Jacob Kirchmann. Um, it's played by uh, Media uh, Bindewald and Nicoletta Munen on uh, historical uh, harpsichords. Um, and the, what interests us maybe more is the um, color enamels. Uh, they were more um, technology that was used in Venice uh, with lots of colors on glass and uh, this uh, technology of using colors on porcelain is uh, something that went from the west to China and uh, thanks to this the, uh, the Chinese started to do much more uh, different colors like um, the rose family of porcelain with lots of colors. This is also something that um, was actually influenced by the Europeans. Okay, so that's about, uh, about it, what I had to say about um, uh, porcelain in, uh, in Meissen, how it was uh, invented, how it was started. I've been drinking this excellent um, New plantation uh, Jin Guanin Baozong uh, from this spring. It will uh, soon hit uh, the, um, uh, the selection. Uh, I've already added um, the more regular uh, Wenhan Baozong. Uh, the quality of, uh, yeah, let me, let me uh, say a few words about the um, Wenhan Baozong. The, the quality is uh, quite good this year. They were able to um, harvest a bit uh, earlier than than usual, uh, and um, there are some uh, again very interesting uh, teas. I took again the Shui Xian and uh, Zhou Gui and the Chilan, and of course we there will be the uh, subtropical forest Baozhong uh, like uh, like usual. Uh, and oh, and one more thing, I already selected a very good Ali Shan Qingxing Wulong from uh, Zhui Feng. Really amazing. Uh, it's really putting a, a very high mark for this year's uh, Wulongs. This one, we always start from, uh, from the lower elevation and uh, an Wulong at this low elevation that is so good is really uh, uh, amazing news! Um, uh, I was wow. This this tastes uh, uh, extraordinary. So so flowery, so so fragrant. Uh, so I have really great hopes for the rest of the season. After uh, selecting this first uh, Alishan, uh, and uh, so I think we are in for a very very good um, uh, season. Uh, of spring for high mountain oolongs. Uh, the prices may have gone up a little bit because of uh, the lack of rain and uh, the reduced quantities, but the quality wow, is really there. 
So, uh, I thank you for uh, following this lesson, and I say probably in uh, two weeks, and we'll continue with uh, porcelain in uh, England. Thank you very much, and uh, see you next time. Bye-bye.